really appreciate all of you being here. Um, we are on camera all across Seattle, people joining for Grand Rounds this morning, and it's so wonderful to have your beautiful faces in front of us. Uh, Dr. Bignall and I both agree that um, we should do it this way more often. Yes. This is great. Yes. Um, so before I introduce uh, the speaker today, I want to um, just acknowledge that it is Black History and Futures Month. And as you all know, every year we have a Grand Round speaker that we host in honor of Martin Luther King Jr. and in honor of Blanche Lavizo. Um, many of you have heard Dr. Martin Luther King's words. Uh, you've seen him on posters. Uh, you see them projected everywhere. I wanted to um, tie our talk into healthcare today. So I used a quote from him from his 1955 meeting in Chicago around healthcare. Just a reminder of the importance of the work we do. And I also thought the picture of him uh, with the kids was really apropos of today. Um, tying it into Blanche, um, Dr. Lovizo, and just recognizing her commitment to um, the legacy of our clinic here and the shoulders that we stand on and her legacy of creating Odessa Brown and opening our clinic. Um, Dr. Luizzo and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. went to school together, and not a lot of people knew that, that they grew up together and their parents were friends. Um, and so this is a really special connection for all of us and a good reminder of the importance of the work we do. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't give the opportunity for everybody online to be jealous. So I just want to <laughs> pretend like we're in Wright Auditorium and ask folks, what is the best clinic in the whole world? I don't think they can hear you. I think you have to be just a little bit louder. One, two, three. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and right auditorium, we just stand up yes. and clap. Well, that's good. Um, so I'd like to introduce my friend and my colleague, Dr. Bignall. I'm going to do your official. Oh, wow. I, okay. I just want people to know your credentials. Thank you. <laughs> um, so he is the chief diversity and health, uh, health equity officer at Nationwide Children's in Columbus, Ohio. He also serves as director of kidney health advocacy and community engagement for the Division of Nephrology and Hypertension. He's an associate professor of pediatrics at, at the Ohio State University right. College oh, of Medicine. Sorry, my mom <laughs> went there, so I know to add the the. Um, he's a graduate of Howard University and Meharry Medical College. Um, he completed his general pediatrics residency and clinical fellowship in nephrology and NIH postdoctoral research fellowship at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Center. I'm going to stop there because what I'd like to do is spend the rest of the time listening to you. Um, but I really appreciate you coming. I really appreciate our friendship and our ability to work together to end racism. Um, it's a really sincere honor to have you here. Thanks thank you for so joining. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yes. Thank you so much. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It is so good to be here. You guys do not understand how special it is for me to be here at Odessa Brown Clinic hanging out with all of you. Um, I am passionate about community engaged healthcare. I'm passionate about um, uh, the kind of work that you do here at Odessa Brown. Um, I'm passionate about Seattle children. This is my third time here, uh, and I love this place. It's just too far away, man. It's too far away from all my peoples, uh, but I absolutely love it here. Every time I have a chance to come, uh, I'm just absolutely honored. Uh, I'll tell you, this is also my, this, this is my third time in Seattle, third time at Seattle Children's. Each time I have arrived, uh, there's been sunshine on my arrival. Uh, so I'm not saying I am responsible for the sunshine, but I am saying I am not responsible for the snow y'all had around here <laughs> last night. So uh, I just wanna make that clear. Um, so it is a real privilege uh, to talk to you today. I'm having some technical difficulties, forgive me. Uh, so I'm not able to see the notes on my slide, but I've, I've given this talk enough. This is, uh, God is testing me today. I, I, know, I, know, I, can, uh, I know I can do this. So uh, it's a real privilege uh, to be here uh, to, and talk to all of you today. Um, I know some of the people who have come and spoken to you too. You know, I saw last year, you guys had Dr. Michael Devon. 
Uh, what you might not know is that Dr. Devon sat down with me for breakfast one day and outlined all of the programs where I should apply for residency. When I was a medical student at Meharry, we, we sat down and had that conversation. So he is partly responsible for me coming to Seattle Children's the first time to interview for residency here uh, and getting my, my, having my first impression. Uh, and I know he was the speaker last year. So the bar is high. The bar is high. I'm going to try my best. Uh, uh, today to uh, uh, to live up to the impressive uh, legacy of the uh, the two namesakes of our lectureship this morning. So here are our objectives. I want to define races and race and racism as social constructs and and overview their historical context here in the United States. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to briefly highlight a few of the racial and ethnic health disparities that we see in pediatric kidney care as a model for linking these uh, to structurally racist and unjust systems that perpetuate disparities in our society. And then I want to discuss our changing anti-racism and health equity landscape and consider the steps that we can take to promote health equity and justice uh, in the work that we do. Uh, I have no relevant financial relationships uh, to disclose. I'm a pediatrician. Um, I mean, you know, we, we're not driving around in Bentleys, y'all. And um, I, I do, however, want to take a moment and just uh, say thank you for the opportunity to be here, particularly to, um, to come and speak uh, in honor of the legacies of these two fantastic doctors, uh, Dr. Blanche uh, Levizo and the incredible work that she did here at Odessa Brown's, uh, you know, planting a foundation, uh, and of course, uh, the incredible and transformative work uh, of Dr. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King uh, Jr. And I am grateful uh, for the honor to speak um, uh, in their memory today. All right, so. I am the chief diversity and health equity officer at one of our nation's um, largest and most academically robust pediatric health centers, Nationwide Children's Hospital, uh, very similar to the incredible prestigious legacy uh, of hospitals that you have here at Seattle Children's. Um, but you know, lately we have been talking about how people are getting tired of discussing health equity. Do, do you know what I'm talking about? Do you feel that here at Odessa Brown? Uh, people are getting tired. The, the, uh, the, the work, the effort is getting harder than it was a few years ago. Uh, and so this question is one that I think we all have asked or we hear people asking uh, it of us. Who cares about equity? Really, who cares about equity anymore? Well, I want to show a picture to you. Uh, this is an ultrasound image of a fetus. This happens to be the first photograph that I ever had of my son. This, maybe this was like the second or third photograph, but every time his face was in front of his, his hand was in front of his face, you know, so I could never see. He still sleeps like that, by the way. He's in his crib. You know, he, he makes, he makes his, his parents anxious. He's, he, he tries to wedge his head into the place where he can get the least amount of air. That's his, that's his goal uh, now as a one-year-old um, in his little crib. But this was the first photograph I could see of him. Uh, he's cute, isn't he? You can tell he's cute. You didn't even have to. You didn't even have to see the full the full thing to know that this is an attractive uh, child. Uh, and uh, my son has already had. It. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. My son has already had an engagement with our hospital's healthcare system on multiple levels in his young life. Okay. Now, when we talk about health equity, you and I are talking about something that is deeply personal. When I talk about racial health equity and racial health disparities, I'm not just talking about something that I read in an academic journal. I'm not just talking about something that uh, is in the news today. I'm talking about my son and his health outcomes, they are personal to me, personal to me. And I am the, as the chief diversity and health equity officer at Nationwide Children's Hospital, top 10 children's hospital, US News, blah, blah, blah. I can do nothing 
to ensure that my son has an equitable outcome. I am entirely reliant on the health care providers who care for him to care about health equity as much as I do. Does that make sense? Okay. So my son is doing well. These are, I'm telling you, he just gets cuter and cuter. I, I, I can't keep showing y'all pictures of my boy. I, otherwise, we'll, we'll just go spend time looking at pictures of him and we're not going to talk about anything else. But, you know, I am just so incredibly uh, proud of him. And, and, and that's a photograph of my, my lovely wife, Dr. Whitney Raglan Bignall. She's a pediatric psychologist at our institution as well. You know, I'm, I'm even raising him to become a young nephrologist. You know, you see, he's already he's already uh, pursuing his studies. Uh, um, uh, this is deeply personal to me, and I want you guys to remember this. For my family and for all families, health equity is personal. No matter who you are, what you look like, no matter if you're from here in Othello or you're from the Central District or you come from, what is it, Mercer Island, Laurelhurst, I know some of these little places that, Bellevue, you know, I, know, I know some of these places, it doesn't matter where. Health equity is personal to you because it's about your family and their outcomes. So rather than asking who cares about equity, maybe should, we should be asking, do you care about equity? Do you care about equity? I love this quote uh, that is attributed to our founding father, uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin. It says, justice will not be served until those who are unaffected are as outraged as those who are. You know, as we think about where our nation is today in the uh, three, almost four years now, post the uh, resurgence of the movement for black lives, the murder of George Floyd and the so-called racial reckoning that our country uh, uh, went through, uh, where are we today? You know, we see black, brown and indigenous people being disenfranchised at the ballot box. We see legislation in states like my own that explicitly target LGBTQ youth. We see uh, xenophobia and uh, rampant anti-immigrant sentiment that would tell my parents and my ancestors that they need to go back where they came from, forgetting that this nation is a nation of people who came from elsewhere, right? That's what we see in our country today. Uh, justice will not be served until those of us who are unaffected are as outraged as those who are. And this leads us to an uncomfortable truism that racism is one of the most significant and pervasive cultural paradigms in the United States, and that race and racism intersect with nearly every aspect of American life. You know, if I had more time with you guys, you don't, because you don't want to hear me talk all day, but if I had more time to talk uh, with you guys today, we could, we could go through each of these systems of inequality and talk about how they intersect with the lives and uh, livelihoods and the well-being and health of our patients and families. Instead, I just want to highlight a few of them, just a few of them, so that we can begin to uh, understand uh, how these things affect all of us. Uh, and uh, I think it's important that we start with the concept of residential segregation, uh, which, by the way, is brilliantly outlined by the uh, author uh, Richard Rothstein in his 2017 bestseller, The Color of Law. I don't know how many of you are, are, are avid readers out there, uh, but don't you feel special, okay? You know, <laughs> readers. Um, no, I listen to audio books, so I, and I think that's reading, too. I don't know. That's my opinion. That's reading, too. It's a terrific read. You, you really must familiarize yourself with this great book, The Color of Law. So as, the, uh, as Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal was seeking to bring Americans out of the mass poverty of the Great Depression, uh, he and his administration developed a suite of programs to provide Americans with the opportunity to own homes, uh, uh, which would in turn provide them with an economic floor. OK, uh, still today, we recognize that home ownership in our country is the primary mechanism for wealth transfer in the United States. Uh, and it allows families to be able to withstand the sort of financial hardships and difficulties that come with, I don't know, seeking medical care, for instance. Right. Uh, however, 
despite the fact that these programs were being uh, subsidized with the tax dollars of every American, only white Americans were allowed to benefit from the programs. Non-white Americans were not even allowed to participate in the work of these subsidized uh, home ownership programs. And in addition to this, in order to determine which neighborhoods across the United States were worthy of municipal investment as this program uh, of rebuilding America from the Great Depression was underway by one of the most liberal presidents of the time, um, the Homeowners Loan Corporation. You, you remember when in, in, in uh, high school history class you learned about the alphabet soup, uh, FDR's alphabet soup, every program he started had some acronym. This one was called the HOLC, the Homeowners Loan Corporation. They drew these red line maps of cities across the United States, not just in the South, y'all, like my hometown of Nashville, not just there, all across the country where they determined which groups of people uh, lived in places where they would encourage municipal investment, all right? Um, I know you guys are familiar with redlining, right? You, by now, we should all know something about redlining. If you don't, I encourage you to go to the Digital Scholarship Lab, DSL, that's the logo down there at the bottom of the screen. The Digital Scholarship Lab is a project of uh, the University of Richmond. Beautiful, if any of you are like me and you go down Wikipedia wormholes and stuff like that, the, the Digital Scholarship Lab is a place you can get lost. So just don't do that when you're here at work at Odessa Brown Children's <laughs> Clinic, okay? Do that at home. Um, it's an incredible resource. Uh, there are red line maps for cities across the United States, coast to coast. Here in Washington, there are red line maps for Seattle, Tacoma, and uh, um, uh, what's the other place out, out, uh, out east? Spokane, right? And then Spokane. Yeah, there's, uh, there, there are red line maps all over this region, and I encourage you to familiarize yourself with them. There's also a myth that we need to debunk right now. It's the myth of so-called de facto segregation. This idea that communities are segregated in our country because people just like living with people who look like them. Okay, that's a comfortable thing to say, but it's false. It's not true. Uh, in fact, we know very, uh, through, through the historical record, we know with tremendous accuracy that the, most communities, particularly wealthy, well-off communities, had restrictive covenants that prevented people, not just white folks, by the way, because at the time, they even made distinctions among white folks. Well, if you're Jewish, we don't want you living here. If you're Polish, we don't want you living here. If you're Irish or Italian or, you know, we don't want you living here. Uh, they would write those uh, distinctions into the deed of the uh, land, of the land, of the property, to prevent those folks from purchasing uh, properties there. Uh, and, uh, and so we actually know that in communities, um, because it was often said, oh, well, uh, it'll bring the property values down. Have you, have you heard that? Oh, if we allow people of color into these other communities, it's going to bring down the property values. These poor, Ray, they, they, didn't mean, they, they weren't being racist. They were just looking after their investment. Now, that's what they were doing. That's what it is said. However, this is also false because we know from the historical record that oftentimes, in particular, black families who had amassed enough wealth to be able to leave their inner city communities and move into the growing suburbs like their white neighbors, they were willing to pay above market value price. And in fact, very often had to pay above market value price in order to purchase into those neighborhoods. That actually raised property values in integrated, newly integrated suburbs across the United States. So in essence, Communities that wanted to keep out these undesirable racial groups did so at their own expense, at their own expense. No such thing as de facto segregation. So let's take a look, a closer look at redlining in Seattle. And uh, so the, the colors uh, that they used, uh, uh, green, uh, green, blue, yellow, and red to indicate from uh, in, in order of increasing um, uncertainty, uh, the value of investment uh, within um, uh, those neighborhoods. Uh, and so let's take a look uh, at A3, Laurelhurst. He heard of that neighborhood? 
Uh, yeah, because that's where our main campus is located, right? Laurel Hurst, A3. This is just south of uh, main campus. Um, uh, and look at the reasons that are given by the federal government for why this neighborhood is safe for uh, investment, right? Uh, professionals live there, okay? They make lots of money, all right? Oh, very choice view properties. Oh, we can see the water. You know, everybody wants to see the water. You know, that's nice. Um, but look there at the bottom. The property is protected by building and racial restrictions. That was viewed as a positive thing, a good thing for this neighborhood. Uh, here's B7. This is specifically where Seattle Children's main campus is now. Wind Windmere and, and Laurelhurst uh, additions. Property is predominantly occupied by owners of moderate means. No racial problems in this area. <laughs> they weren't allowed to come. Uh, uh, north uh, of the lake there, right? All right, here's another uh, community. Y'all know this one, right? Capitol Hill, North Broadway District. Uh, I love how it says it's populated by well-to-do and formerly well-to-do people. I don't, <laughs> I don't exactly know what that means. But, uh, but the, the, the portion that I've highlighted at the bottom here, the locality has no racial problems, nor has it a problem of the influx of people of a lower earning standard. Wow, this is the reason given for this community to uh, uh, be invested in here in the city. Okay, well, what about South Seattle, where we are right now? Uh, here's C15. This, this community um, is uh, near where a lot of our patients are coming from here to Othello, uh, uh, the Othello Brown, um, uh, sorry, Odessa Brown Clinic here in Othello. Um, very spotted residential di uh, district composed of people of numerous nationalities. That is why this neighborhood was downgraded. Um, D5 and D4, this is the central uh, uh, neighborhood where uh, Odessa Brown Central Clinic is located. Uh, the district is composed of various mixed nationalities. D4 was just labeled as, this is the Negro area of Seattle. By the way, this was the only text given to designate the neighborhood D4, which is just north of the neighborhood that's highlighted in D5. Uh, I know uh, having looked at the, at the map and cross-referenced this with the modern day map of Seattle that the Odessa Brown Central Clinic is actually in D5, but D4 is just north of there. This is the, the neighborhood historically where uh, our patients were coming from to Odessa Brown, right? That was the only statement made about this neighborhood that was used to determine its value, according to the federal government, for municipal investment. Just in case you think this is just a history lesson, right? History has present day implications. Uh, the, again, from the University of Richmond, they have another project called the Not Even Past Project that cross-references the, on the left side of the screen, the neighborhoods that have been redlined with, on the right side of the screen, the current day social vulnerability score of those neighborhoods. And even despite the fact that there's been tremendous gentrification within much of downtown Seattle, we can still see the remnants of the effects of redlining on the present day communities. A3, Laurel Hurst, the social vulnerability score is still significantly uh, lower for that neighborhood than others in the city. And you guys, you guys, you can figure this color coded system out, can't you? That, that ain't too hard. You can see where Odessa Brown is. You can see where the colors get more vibrant down there at the bottom, right? Take a look in the Laurelhurst neighborhood at their outcomes for uh, the number of minority, the percent of minority people who live in the community, life expectancy, some of the highest in the city, uh, rates of diabetes, high blood pressure, kidney disease, and mental health problems, all relatively low compared to other neighborhoods. Here's C13. C13 is here in South Seattle. Look, again, even with gentrification happening in the city, we can still see large proportions of the neighborhood in C13 have low social vulnerability scores. And look at their outcomes. Higher percentage of minorities, of course, this is where many of the uh, minority families have been pushed to, and this is the neighborhood that many of these families have been pushed to. Uh, life expectancy lower, median age, cancer, diabetes, high blood pressure, kidney disease. I mean, the kidney disease thing breaks my heart, y'all. That's my thing, you know. 
Um, so, so this is ex these are the forces that our community is uh, going through today based on the legacy that is nearly a century old, a century old, and our communities are still dealing with this problem. And if I just told you guys that home ownership was one of the primary vehicles for wealth transfer in our country, then it should be no shock to you that if people of color have historically been precluded from owning a home, that they ain't got no money, no wealth, do not have the opportunity to build wealth. Take a look at this uh, graphic here uh, that shows that the uh, median uh, wealth for a uh, black family in the United States is one is 10 cents, 10 cents on every dollar of wealth accrued by a white family. And it has its root not only in the segregation that I showed you before, but things like wage inequality and the higher unemployment rate, banking and lending discrimination. I can't, I feel like every time I turn on the news, Wells Fargo is getting in trouble again for discriminating against people of color. Uh, racial disparities in home ownership, and of course, a lack of intergenerational wealth. All right, I wanna take a moment and set a definition. I don't know if you, like me, have struggled to define racism. Well, what is racism really? What does it actually mean? Well, I'm going to give you a definition today that I hope you will use forever, okay? In fact, those of you who like to tweet, you know, and I still call them tweets, even though that crazy man is in charge. I still call them tweets. Uh, or you like to post on it. Go ahead. You can take a picture of the slide. You can uh, shout out um, the incomparable Dr. Kamara Jones. Those of you who don't know who Dr. Kamara Phyllis Jones is, uh, you're in for a treat when you go home later today and, and look her up. She's absolutely fantastic. And she posited this definition of racism that I believe is the best definition of racism that exists anywhere. Racism is, quote, a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how one looks, which is what we call race. That unfairly, dis it does three things, y'all. Racism does three things. One, it unfairly disadvantages some people. Two, it unfairly advantages other people. After all, if no one received an advantage from racism, it would cease to exist. But the most insidious thing that racism does, number three, it saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. Imagine the millions of authors, actors, scientists, doctors, uh, parents, um, uh, inventors, engineers that our society has been robbed of because of the centuries long history of racial uh, apartheid and enslavement in this country. Imagine if we as a society had instead leveraged those gifts and those gifted people to make our society better. How much further along we would be today, right? And what I love about uh, Dr. Jones' um, definition uh, of racism is that we can extrapolate it to apply to other systems of, of oppression in society, right? Think about how this definition could be rephrased, restructured to apply to other marginalized groups in our society. Women, immigrants, LGBTQ folk, indigenous folk, people with disabilities, people living in poverty, people living in rural communities, right? We could use this definition uh, and apply it to them as well because all of those folks are marginalized in our society by systems that assign value and structure opportunity at their expense. I want you to remember that definition. Um, it's no surprise that race and racism as social constructs that are pervasive in American society have found their way into medicine. I won't dwell here very long in the interest of time. Just know that um, the debunked pseudoscience of uh, using uh, rudimentary early medical spirometers to measure the lung capacity of people of color was used as justification for their enslavement. Oh, these folks have poor lung capacity, and if we allow them to work in the fields, we're actually strengthening them. We're strengthening their lungs. This is literally uh, the kind of pseudoscience that has been uh, pushed by the medical community through much of the 20th century. All right. 
So we've talked a little bit about racism and its structures here in, uh, in our country. Let's discuss a little bit how racism and structural inequality might affect uh, and influence pediatric kidney care. Now, now, why am I using pediatric kidney care as an example? Well, uh, because it is objectively the best subspecialty in all of pediatric medicine. So now, no, I'm just kidding. No, actually, I, I'm doing it uh, because this is the field that I belong to. And I am hoping, especially those of you on the call who are in academic medicine uh, on the campus, main campus of Seattle Children's, I'm hoping that everyone will be able to think about how they can use the, the framework that I will propose for you to apply to your own work, understanding why there are disparities, particularly racial disparities, in care outcomes for different groups, okay? So here we go. Um, the first thing uh, I wanna do is talk a little bit about um, estimated kidney function uh, and the glomerular filtration rate equation. Now, I know I, I saw y'all glazed over, y'all's eyes glazed over. <laughs> work, work with me here, okay? Work with me, all right? I'm gonna break it down for you in a way they never broke it down for you in medical school, I promise, okay? So uh, in order to avoid uh, invasive and expensive methods for measuring directly how well your kidneys work, we use a biomarker called creatinine. Creatinine, which is a protein found in muscle and varies with muscle, uh, muscle mass and body composition of different people, all right? Well, it turns out that the estimating equations that have been developed to uh, approximate kidney function in individuals, that there was a statistically significant difference in the studies, initial studies that were done, uh, looking at um, the, the estimated kidney function in people who were black and people who were not black. To account for this, it was suggested that, oh, it must be because the black people have more muscle mass. That must be the reason. Black folks are just built different, and that must be the reason why the creatinine is higher. They didn't do any investigating into their diet. They didn't understand if there were other medications that these patients were taking that might have influenced the results. Nope, we just are gonna assume it's because black bodies have been working in the field long enough that they're stronger and built differently than everyone else. I want you to look at me and tell me how much creatinine you think I got in my body, okay? So to apply a universal correction, which is what was done, they, a, they call it a race coefficient to every black person to, to a correct for this difference that they saw in these handful of studies, all right? Now, what's particularly insidious about this is that the cohort uh, that they looked at in the study was separated into two groups. They didn't look at all racial groups. They looked at two groups, black and not black. <laughs> all right. First of all, how was it determined that these people were black? Was it just looking at them? Because we know that's problematic. If you're just trying to look at somebody and determine if they're black or not black, how black are they? I tell people all the time, I'm an eighth Scottish. All right. I was going to wear my kilt this morning, but it was a little bit drafty outside and I decided I, would, I wouldn't do that. I'm an eighth Scottish. How is it that you know that my kidney genes don't come from my Scottish ancestor? You're making an assumption based on my race, based on your interpretation of my physical characteristics and my skin color about my kidney function? That makes no sense. It makes no sense. And yet this is what was done in our society. Uh, one of my very good friends, Dr. Amaka Nanya, who is uh, now uh, has an academic health equity leadership role at Emory University, uh, did this work while she was at the University of Pennsylvania. She actually chronicled how this assumption, this faulty assumption, actually perpetuates health disparities for black folks. Um, if you overestimate a black person's kidney function, you can put them at risk of higher doses of, of medications, inappropriately high doses of medications if in fact their kidney function is worse. They spend longer waiting for a transplant. They wait longer before getting referred for 
uh, kidney uh, services from a nephrologist, and it takes longer to get them started on dialysis. All things that negatively impact their kidney health outcomes. So I'm very proud uh, to, or what, what, before, before we do that, sorry, I, I want to I talk a little bit about how the structural inequities that we overviewed earlier, how they intersect with an understanding of these inequities uh, in kidney, an estimated kidney function. Number one, we know that many of the communities most likely to be at risk of this inappropriate estimation of their kidney function are also communities where there's decreased access to nutritious food that could accelerate the progression of chronic kidney disease. We need to see these patients sooner rather than later. Uh, disproportionate representation of low-wage jobs and underinsured status means it's already hard for black folks to access care in many communities. And delaying their referral for kidney care is done at tremendous risk to them. <clears throat> Excuse me, poor health literacy and the inability to navigate the healthcare system means that patients present later in the disease course already. Increased stress and what we call allostatic load that is associated with neighborhoods that are over-policed can contribute to renal vascular uh, disease risk. High blood pressure, it's stressful living in these communities. Uh, and these patients should be seen sooner rather than later. And then finally, if we delay a patient's referral for chronic kidney disease, dialysis, and transplant care, uh, the longer uh, wait times can result in them having increased morbidity and unfortunately mortality on dialysis waiting for a transplant, waiting for a transplant. So I'm proud to say that the American Society of Nephrology, uh, the society uh, to which I belong and the National Kidney Foundation put together a task force, determined that in fact race modifiers should not be included in the estimating equations for kidney function and actually showed that a new equation that they were able to model using the mathematics uh, actually performs better when you remove the race modifier out of the equation, when you remove it from the equation, performs better. Uh, these are the equations that are being circulated within the medical community today. I want to show you another paper, this one from one of my very dear friends, Dr. Michelle Starr. Some of you may remember Dr. Michelle Starr. She was a resident and fellow here at Seattle Children's. Uh, and then some of the other names you'll recognize as well, colleagues here um, uh, on, on this uh, publication. Uh, and uh, she and her colleagues here at Seattle Children's were trying to understand the connection between food insecurity uh, and end-stage kidney disease patients, patients on dialysis at uh, the main campus. By the way, uh, Dr. Raj took me uh, around to, to see the uh, new dialysis unit that y'all have here at uh, Seattle Children's. Y'all should know that is the best, I'm, I'm not even exaggerating, that is the gold standard pediatric dialysis unit in the country right now. Like, I'm gonna go back to, to my folks and be like, hey, what we doing? We gotta step it up. Seattle is, is you know, they're busting our butts. We gotta step it up over here. Um, and uh, so you all should be very proud of, of your nephrology group and the work that they're doing uh, providing care for this patient population. So uh, we recognize that 20% of families in the United States are food insecure. By the way, that's ridiculous. One in every five people in the richest country in the world don't know where their next meal is coming from. That's a problem, okay? But 60% of children on dialysis and their families are food insecure. And by the way, that's not a Seattle children's problem. I guarantee you, you look at any pediatric in-center dialysis program in the United States and you're gonna see very similar numbers to that. And those patients also have higher healthcare utilization, increased infection rates, and lower health-related quality of life. All things that keep Dr. Raj up at night as y'all's uh, dialysis medical director. Okay, so how again do structural inequalities interface with this? Housing status can impact your options for dialysis and puts patients at risk. We know that housing insecurity is a major risk factor for food insecurity. Uh, you don't have to be a nephrologist to know that you need good nutrition to have healthy kidneys, right? Uh, even the uh, TikTok influencer will tell you that, you know? Um, so we know that these things are inextricably linked. Um, the ability to purchase nutritious foods, caregivers who work multiple low-wage jobs are often uh, unable to assist in care uh, of these patients. And uh, we've already talked about the legacy of residential segregation and redlining and how it correlates with food deserts. We've talked about over-policed neighborhoods being less likely to uh, attract fresh food vendors. By the way, I don't know what y'all did to get a Safeway across the street here, 
But that must have taken an act of God himself. I, you all should be so proud, so proud that we have a grocery store in Othello Square. Like this is really impressive. Many other institutions have tried to do, to replicate this kind of thing and struggle to locate uh, uh, grocery stores in communities where uh, where there are challenges, socioeconomic challenges. And so that's terrific work. And then finally, of course, <clears throat> the increased healthcare utilization in the context of end-stage kidney disease places a burden on the safety net programs that the subsidized safety net programs, often taxpayer funded, that families uh, rely on. Um, all right, so the other thing I don't want to do all the time, I, I vowed I won't do this anymore. You know how we have presentations like this and people just give you a long list of all the ways black people are sick and people of color are sick and everything that's going wrong with women and why LGBTQ folks have worse outcomes and blah, blah, blah. And you can just leave a talk like that depressed. You, you know what I mean? All right. But remember, the same way that these disparities are a result of social engineering and decisions, intentional or unintentional, that are made by people, we can engineer systems to correct this too. We're not powerless. We're not powerless. That's what I love about this last paper uh, that was written by my friend and colleague, Dr. Jill Chrisberg. She is a pediatric nephrologist at Lurie Children's in Chicago, but did this work while she was a fellow at Stanford here on the West Coast, the best coast. Uh, and she was looking at uh, some changes that were made uh, about a decade prior that helped were that were intended to improve the um, allocation of kidneys to make it more fair, more equitable for all racial groups. We recognize that there were some disparities, uh, that there were certain um, communities of color who were not getting access to kidney transplants. And the national organization made some changes and we wanted to see how well those changes worked. And the short answer is that they did. We were able to engineer changes that decreased the time, uh, or rather made more equitable the time for individuals um, who were, once they got onto the kidney transplant list, their access to a kidney was equitable. All right, and there were some other uh, improvements in, in equity that were seen there. That is a huge success story. Uh, we basically, we closed the gap. We engineered systems that closed the gap and improved the equity for those families. How else can we close those equity gaps? How else can we close those equity gaps? Well, we can advocate for safe and affordable housing for all children, especially those with chronic conditions like kidney disease. We can improve access to an education regarding healthy, nutritious, and kidney-friendly foods. We can support institutional and societal policies that limit the influence of one's income on their ability to access excellent kidney and pediatric care. It's ridiculous in this country that the only way for you to get good health care is if you have a job from an employer who uh, is benevolent enough to, to offer you health care. Uh, improved patient education and health literacy can help to address uh, issues with adherence and psychosocial barriers that can preclude listing for kidney transplantation. And of course, we want to advocate for safe and healthy environments uh, for all of our patients, uh, particularly in this age where we're dealing with uh, a climate crisis. All right. How do you use race in your clinical practice? Now, Dr. Ray, you just told me that race is a social construct with no biological underpinning. And yet you just showed me all this data that says that people have different health outcomes based on race. What gives? What gives? Well, I'll tell you what gives. I'm not saying that race isn't real. After all, we've made it real. It's as real as apple pie in America. The difference is that race is not a biological risk factor for conditions, but rather the way race influences the care that a patient receives, the environment in which a patient lives. So our tendency to want to link race to outcomes, we've gotta be really discerning as child health professionals when we seek to make that connection. Understand that very often when you see a link between a group, a particular racial group, and a health outcome, you're not seeing the influence of race 
on that health outcome, but rather the influence of racism on that health outcome. And this should be no surprise to us because we, as you know, well-informed, passionate and enthusiastic uh, Odessa Brown Children's Clinic employees understand that as much as 80% of an individual's health outcome is related to things that are entirely outside of what happens in this building. In fact, you all have noticed it so well that you've brought some of those stuff, those things into this building, right? We appreciate the socioeconomic factors, the physical environment and health behaviors uh, that can impact patients. And we know that systems of inequality, uh, that chronic underinvestment in, in real estate and the built environment, that unhealthy behaviors, and even things like medical distrust can negatively impact an individual's health well before they make it into your clinic here. Let's take a quick second and talk about medical distrust, because I hear about this a lot. You know, people want to talk about medical distrust, particularly in the African-American community. And I know y'all thought I was going to talk about Tuskegee, right? Oh, my goodness, we beat this poor thing to death, the Tuskegee uh, uh, study. Uh, and, and yes, of course, it definitely did damage. It did damage within the community. Uh, but we really should think about the more contemporary examples of medical distrust. These things happen all the time, every day. In fact, I bet if you approach a person of color and you ask them if they or their family members have had a negative experience with a healthcare provider that they believe may have in, in whole or in part been due to their identity, I am almost certain that you're gonna get a yes answer. They can tell you maybe one or more stories uh, that have uh, affected them. I think a great example of this, uh, um, uh, an unfortunate example of this is the uh, black maternal mortality crisis in this country that nearly claimed the life of tennis icon and greatest of all time, yes, greatest of all time, the GOAT, uh, Serena Williams. You know, this picture is quite old because that is Olympia, her first child, the pregnancy, uh, uh, the pregnancy of which was the one that was complicated. Uh, and we know she has another child now. Um, uh, the struggle to trust also involves myths and conspiracy theories. Have y'all heard this one before? Yeah, yeah. Get that organ donor bleep off your ID. Why? What, what's, the, what's the implication here? They're not gonna try to save your life if they know you're an organ donor, right? Now we know this isn't true, right? Because um, the, the, at what step in the ABCs of resuscitation do I check a patient's wallet to see if they're an organ donor? We, we, don't, we don't do that, we don't do that. But this is the kind of pervasive myth that's in the community that negatively impacts our patient's ability to access care. Uh, I love what this young man, Dr. Derek Paul, wrote when he was a medical student at, uh, I believe it was UCSF, he wrote, when clinical medicine can't do any more to help your patient, but society can, social advocacy becomes the standard of care. I also love this quote from Dr. Kimberly Manning. Many of you may know her. She is a world-renowned uh, internist uh, and uh, medical educator at Emory University. She practices at Grady Memorial Hospital in Atlanta. Uh, and she herself is a graduate of Tuskegee University. She herself uh, enrolled in one of the COVID vaccine trials in order to help convince her community of its safety. And Dr. Uh, Manning wrote about her experience in The Lancet, and I love, love, love this quote. She says, acknowledging every aspect of the barriers for black Americans to enroll in clinical trials is critical to moving forward. We are not simply untrusting, we remember. We remember, it's not only that your marginalized patients don't trust you, it's that they remember the experience they had the last time they saw somebody who looks like you doing the job you do. And instead of asking what's wrong with them, why they don't trust us, maybe we should start asking what we need to do to regain their trust, all right? So building durable and trusting relationships in kidney health and indeed all of pediatric health is our collective responsibility and uh, pursuing health equity should be our path forward. Um, I'm running out of time and I apologize for that, but I'll just, I'll just give you a few things that we can do to respond in our clinical practice. First thing we can do is we, we, need, to act, we need to stop pretending that these things don't exist around us. We know that um, our minoritized colleagues deal with 
racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, uh, xenophobia. We know that they deal with these problems uh, every day. Beg your pardon. And, um, and we need to uh, make sure that they know that they are seen, valued, and heard. We need to champion workforce diversity and inclusion in a real way, okay? It's more than pretty pictures on the brochure. You know how they, they always ask the same like three residents to be on the brochure, you know, because I, I was one of them. I remember <laughs> I, I would always get asked, we, we gotta start moving beyond that to, to really bring people and their ideas to the table when we're making decisions. Um, I love that I'm part of a specialty that is pediatrics that really does care, really does acknowledge boldly and full-throatedly uh, that uh, the impact of racism on, on child uh, health, and, and we can all be proud of that. I'm also to be proud to be a part of a, an institution at Nationwide Children's where uh, my colleague, uh, future colleague actually, she just signed her contract to join our faculty, Dr. Monica Hoff, uh, and, and, and I were part of a project to uh, improve our representation within our residency program. We want our residency program to look like the community we're serving, right? Uh, that's really important, and you can see some of the steps that we took to achieve that, and, and we were able to make tremendous strides in improving residency representation uh, within our program. We're proud of those sorts of interventions. We gotta start screening for social determinants of health, and oh, by the way, when we screen for them, have something to do. Have something to offer people when you find out about all the terrible things happening in their life that are negatively impacting their health care. Engage new voices. If everybody you know uh, that you talk to looks like and sounds like you, you're not talking to enough people. You know, learn how to engage new voices. Uh, social media is a great place for that. Do it safely. Uh, but uh, that's a terrific place uh, to engage new voices and learn new perspectives. Uh, I definitely do think that there is a role for implicit bias training. I, I do think so. Um, I'm not so down on it as other people are. Uh, but we need to remember to do some explicit bias training too, you know, um, because uh, there are people who are just explicitly biased uh, towards others. Uh, some of us have explicit biases, myself included, that need to be corrected. I've had people call me aside and, uh, and, and, and suggest ways that I could be less biased in the work that I do, and humbly I've appreciated their input in my life. All of us can, uh, can do better. You know, I wanted to share this uh, with you. Uh, how many of you have heard of APAMSA? APAMSA, the Asian and Pacific American Medical Student Association, which by the way was founded by the gentleman I'm pictured with in the center photo, Dr. B. Lee, who is an emeritus professor of pediatrics at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, but started uh, a PAMSA while he was a medical student uh, in his training. I'm so proud that I've had an opportunity to connect with him. Um, a, a PAMSA invited me to speak at their national conference as a keynote speaker in 2022. It was the first time that I, as a minority, was the only minority of my group in a room full of people of another minority group. This was a really weird experience for me, okay? I'm used to being the only black person in a room full of white people. I understand what that experience is like. But to be the only black person in a room full of Asian and Pacific Americans was really, really interesting. It gave me tremendous perspective, and by the way, empathy for how some of my white colleagues must feel when they are in you know, my black church. <laughs> uh, it can be disorienting for them. And, and learning, learning how to exist in that space with humility and appreciating that they invited me to talk about my experience as a minority. By the way, I had to wonder, would we invite an Asian or Pacific American medical student to come, or a, a physician to present at a conference of black medical students to talk about their experience as a minority? Hello, maybe something we should think about. Um, it gave me a lot of perspective. It put me in a very different, not uncomfortable. I was not uncomfortable. They made me very comfortable. Uh, but it put me in a very different space. And I had to learn a new thing about myself and how I uh, interfaced with, uh, with this community. It was a real, real pleasure. The young lady here to the side was a mentee that I picked up that day. 
uh, future Dr. Kathleen Ho, uh, who is a first-generation Vietnamese-American young lady and uh, looking forward to her applying to medical school. I don't know, maybe here at the University of uh, Washington. I, I'll, I'll let her know. I'll let her know. I'll put in a good word. Uh, we got to listen first, seek first to understand, and then be understood. You all know this. This is what you guys do at Odessa Brown all the time. Center at the margins. That's also important. We got to resist the urge to colonize the communities where we work. <laughs> we got to appreciate that communities that are disadvantaged are not disadvantaged because they're lazy or stupid or they lack resources or gifted, talented people, that they are often oppressed and are just looking for you to be the partner to work with them to help lift them out of the situation they're in. But they don't need you to lead all the time. Sometimes they just need you to have their back. You, you remember when you were learning to ride your bike and your mama, your daddy had held that bike for you? They don't need you. They, if they had gotten on the bike and started, it wouldn't have helped. That, that's not going to teach you. They just needed you to make sure that, that or they, you just needed them rather to make sure you didn't fall. And sometimes that's what the community needs from us. They need us to be in the background helping them, not always in the forefront. Finally, we need to practice what we preach. If we're going to ask people of color to fix the problems they did not create that affect them, we need to make sure that they have the FTEs to do it. We need to make sure that they have the training to do it, that the support to do it. Uh, we need to uh, avoid over-reliance on minoritized team members to do the work by themselves. And we need to be willing to take risks and be transparent. So where are we today? I think it is fair for us to understand where we have been. Nothing wrong with recognizing and understanding where we have been and being proud of where we are today, the progress we are making today, uh, and the tremendous legacy of individuals, community members, and organizers like Odessa Brown, uh, the shoulders upon which we stand. And, and we have work to do uh, ourselves at Nationwide Children's in, in Columbus, uh, work that I'm proud to be a part of, uh, and uh, immensely, immensely proud to have had the opportunity to talk to you all today and happy to take some questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. There are some wonderful comments in the chat. Um, sharing some of the links of some of the things you talked about. Uh, Dr. Carrera urging us to uh, advocate for Medicaid, mm -hmm. and Dr. Bowie actively recruiting your mentee to Seattle Children's. Right, so, yeah, she's so already, so, already know, signed the contract. Some good flavor in the chat, sorry, good flavor sorry, in the sorry, chat. Sorry about that, that's all right. Uh, we have probably time for one question. I don't have any questions in the chat yet. Are there any questions in the audience knowing that Odessa gets to to share I know, your time for another, a little bit yeah. while, a little bit longer. Yeah. Um, any questions? Yes. Dr. Coker. Thank you so much, Ray, for that really Thank wonderful you. talk. Um, can you talk a little bit about, I think, I found it, the story, I love the way that you described the story about the creatinine and how that came about, and it's so fascinating. And so your, what's your perspective on why it happened? And it's mm -hmm. just interesting if, yes. it, if it was about, yeah. you know, the way that it, it, sent, it went one way for black yeah. folks and it went another way for everybody else. Everybody else. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, yeah, how yeah. did that... It's a great question. Look, the truth of the matter is there is a statistically significant difference in these studies, and there have been other studies that have replicated this statistically significant difference in creatinine levels, serum creatinine levels, um, between when, when um, people of African ancestry are compared with others. Um, I think the problem is not recognizing this difference. Rather, the problem is attributing this difference to some sort of biological phenomenon that is based on a racial categorization. That's the issue. It would be very different if we said, oh, people of African ancestry, people with at least 60% African ancestry, people who have these 
um, these particular, these particular uh, gene, this particular gene expression that we know correlates with folks of African ancestry. There, there are indeed um, many genetic markers. An example of this is ApoL1 that we talk about a lot. This is a, a gene marker that's found in people of African ancestry. It is thought that this uh, confers some advantage uh, to individuals at risk of uh, trypanosomal infection uh, and African sleeping sickness. In a similar fashion as the sickle cell disease mutation is thought to confer a genetic benefit um, once, uh, as a trait uh, against malarial infection. It, it's a very similar um, mechanism that's been proposed. So, so there are, and, and ApoL1 um, people who are uh, homozygous for the, at the ApoL1 risk allele, they are at significantly increased risk of progressive kidney disease, chronic kidney disease. So that's a real thing. Like I'm not saying that we pretend that um, racial groups in our country are not at increased risk of other things. But I think making this assumptive leap that the reason is because their bodies are different is fraught with peril. And it can cause us to do, th that to, um, to do things that put those populations actually at increased risk, like my friend and colleague, Dr. Ananya, was pointing out, that we can't just assume, oh, well, they're different. Black people are different. I actually had an argument with uh, a patient uh, the other day, a really lovely um, grandmother of one of my patients who was trying to say, oh, well, you know, obviously black bodies are different. This is the reason why we are. This is and it's a very dangerous assumption to make. And I had to say, actually, ma'am, no, we are not different. We're not different. We don't experience pain differently. We don't um, we're not healthier, you know, in, in, uh, inherently because of our racial identity. That's not what confers those things to us. Um, and, and we don't get full genetic profiles on every community of color. So I, I will never know, you know, uh, for most black folks, if there is um, some particular genetic thing that puts them advantage or disadvantage for a particular disease or not. So I think we should just be very careful making that assumptive leap. I'm not trying to suggest that, I mean, it's true. There was a statistically significant difference that has to be accounted for somehow in the literature. But just to assume it's because, well, obviously black people are more muscular, you know, like, no, this is a, this is a huge fallacy. And I think it's the reason why the society said, let's move away from music. And by the way, in pediatric uh, calculators to assess kidney function, race has never been used. Race has never been used. And we do a terrific job, I think, of estimating kidney function in kids. So it's not like we need to be using it anyway. So um, I think uh, those are sort of my thoughts on, on it and how I think we should move forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.